Thank you, uh, Ascendum, for, for having me here. And um, through a strange coincidence, they have me here first talking about Anthem's digital transformation. And then uh, Tony is going to talk about uh, why digital transformations uh, fail. So, <laughs> I, you know, thanks, thanks for setting me up perfectly, by the way, for, for doing this. And I think that's probably the first time that we're presenting in this format. Uh, and so, perfect. Uh, but listen, uh, sincerely, uh, Mahendra, thank you for, for having us, uh, Chris, today. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with the Ascendum team over the years, and uh, you guys bring um, you know, a lot of genuine passion about doing what's right for, for your clients. And your people embody that, and uh, it shows in the results, so, so thank you for doing that. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today really was um, uh, Anthem. Uh, what are we doing to, to digitize healthcare? And uh, you know how we're going about it, and, and show you some some examples of, of the kind of work that that's happening. So, before I get into that, so I want to take you back a, a few centuries uh, to you know the origins of insurance and the rapid pace in which it's it's grown over time. Uh, so it turns out that uh, as I was doing my research here, uh, Lloyd's uh, of London, the big insurance company, and you know, probably one of the, the largest in the world. Uh, turns out it was a coffee shop on, on the River, river Thames. And uh, the, the merchants and the people that, were, uh, have, that owned the, the ships got together and said, you know, we need a way to protect our downside risk in the event that weather happens and the ships sink. So uh, that's how Lloyd's of London was created as the first insurance company in the world. And um, since then, insurance has been about protecting downside risk. Um, some adverse event happens, an accident, house burns down, uh, adverse health event happens, and uh, that then leads to insurance kicking in. So uh, not much has changed since uh, 1691 when uh, Lloyd's uh, first created that. This is a picture of a um, uh, church in Scotland. Uh, it's rumored to be the first uh, institution that created life insurance. So uh, the parishioners in that church uh, and um, essentially uh, participated in a term life policy where they paid into that, that policy and got paid out. And um, I was looking at the actuarial tables just for kicks and uh, not, not that far up <laughs> from where we are today. And uh, you know, I, was, I was just relaying this to our actuaries at Anthem and they were really offended. So if you, if you work for an insurance company, don't ever go back to your actuaries and say nothing much has changed in the church called Scotland Invented Life Insurance. Uh, but there's hope. Uh, there's, there's, um, there's some innovation that's happening in the insurance industry, and I'll get to what Anthem is doing in a second, but uh, you know, I want to give you an example of what, what's happening in property and casualty insurance. Uh, so I live in Los Angeles, and uh, a lot of, lots of good things happen there, traffic, smog, and fires. And so I was researching um, one day, uh, well, what's really going on with uh, you know, property and casualty innovation? So it turns out there's this company that's a startup uh, that's got a, a drone service that will sell you a subscription for uh, essentially deploying drone technology to identify uh, fires and prevent them from, from happening in the first place. So they would scout the, the hills and the higher fire, high risk areas and continually go out and alert the authorities to the preventive measures that need to happen. So it's nothing to do with you know what happens actuarially if uh, you're underwriting a uh, you know, a household that wants to buy insurance uh, to protect their properties. It's more about buying a subscription to, to make sure that fires don't happen to begin with. So as that got me thinking as to how does this apply to health? You know, because at the end of the day, insurance in healthcare is about when we, we get to the hospital taking care or where we see a doctor uh, taking care of all the financial events that, that's around it. Uh, which, which is really all about managing the risk, you know, taking care of the sick. And obviously, you know, all insurance companies, whether you're a property and casualty insurance company or your life insurance company or your health insurance company, you have to, to be good at doing that. But what if we had the equivalent of the drone service and provided the, the preventive mechanisms that, that said, let's keep people healthy rather than uh, take care of them while they're sick and send them lots of easy to understand bills uh, to, uh, to kind of understand what, what's happening. 
Uh, but then to do that, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, change that's needed because the uh, insurance company's uh, NPS ratings, the net promoter score ratings, are just above cable companies. So we're really competing with the best in the business of, 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 of getting trust with our customers. So we've got some work to do, uh, which is uh, we got to move from being uh, purely managing the risk and being good at that to proactively identifying uh, how we can keep people healthy, and then also working on our brand so that people look to us to, to keep, it, keep them healthy uh, as opposed to someone that's just managing downside risk. So that's, that's the, the promise. Um, and this is in particularly uh, a new idea, and you know, others before uh, us at Anthem have come up with this and have espoused it and have tried to, to, to do this. Uh, so I want to get into and say, well, why is the time now? Why is it? Why is it? Why is it? Why might it succeed uh, before Tony gets here and, and perhaps gives us some wisdom on why it may not work? Right. Uh, so lots happening, right? So um, we're living longer. We're, uh, you know, most of the people that in the, across the world live in urban areas. Um, life expectancy has rapidly increased uh, in in most cases in a in a few years from now. This notion of working for one employer uh, is probably going to go away, and uh, much like um, the sharing economy, uh, the millennium workforce might be always working for more than one employer at a time. So, given all of that, you know, what are the implications to, to insurance and, and the employer uh, provided benefits and design? That's kind of one one set of things to consider. The other is, um, you know, from a, from a tech and data and digital perspective. We know uh, clouds uh, probably already passe. We've already moved on to edge computing. Uh, we've got data, robotics, AI. All of these things are, are growing at an exponential clip. So if you put all that together, so faster, cheaper computing power, you've got lots of mega trends that are all happening at the same time. Robotics, 3D printing. Um, I heard the other day that um, you can now 3D print uh, live tissue. Um, so I was having a couple of drinks at the bar. So. Good news is I can probably 3D print my liver in case something happens. But synthetic biology, 5G is amazing, uh, networks and sensors, there's going to be a trillion sensors. You know, just think about that. So if there's a trillion sensors with AI and 5G, what kind of business models are we going to be able to create in that future? And think about the disruption it's going to cause. And if we don't get ahead of it, all of us here, whether we're Kroger or we're Anthem or we're um, fill in the blank enterprise, uh, we're either going to be taking advantage of this or someone else is going to do that on our behalf and we will be out of business. But it's really a question about business model innovation. It's not really about technology. Just to give you an example of the, the faster, cheaper computing power. So this is sort of a, a plot of, um, you know, take my, um, you know, sort of laptops, maybe about $1,000, and the calculations per second of this $1,000 laptop just plotted on a logarithmic curve, uh, by 2030, uh, the calculations per second are going to exceed that of uh, human brain. Probably already exceeds my computing cap capacity. By 2030, it's going to exceed the computing capacity of the average human. And then by uh, 2050, it, that same $1,000 laptop is going to exceed the collective computing capacity of all of humanity. So let's say there are 10 billion people by 2050, it's going to exceed the computing capacity of up to 10 billion people. So that type of computing capacity just on a simple device uh, opens up infinite possibilities around the innovation that can happen, just to give you one example. Uh, so sometimes these changes happen, um, and they take a lot of time. Uh, and sometimes they happen in a blink of an eye. It seems like it happens in a blink of an eye. Uh, so speaking of that, I want to play a, a quick video clip of a theoretical physicist that frames these possibilities in a way that I think nicely summarizes potential as well as risk. Uh, so if the video cooperates, let's see if this works. So when we put on our contact lenses and blink, we will go online. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? <laughs> College students taking final examinations. <laughs> this means that my students will blink and they will not have to memorize all the things I've been talking about. This is going to revolutionize education because we cannot force students to memorize things that they can simply blink and get. And then if you feel sick, you will blink and see RoboDoc. RoboDoc is artificially intelligent. Talks to you in plain English or Russian or whatever, speaks any language, 
accesses the entire internet for sound <coughs> medical advice, almost for free. This is going to revolutionize the medical establishment. We'll still have doctors, but doctors will use RoboDoc as an aid. And if you're in a car accident in a foreign country, you don't speak the language, you'll talk to your wristwatch and talk to RoboLawyer. RoboLawyer understands the law in any country, in any language. In fact, I personally believe that artificial intelligence, the robotics industry, will eventually become bigger than the automobile industry of today. So even the economy is now being digitized into something I call perfect capitalism. You see, capitalism is based on supply and demand. But you don't know who's cheating you when you buy something. You don't know what the profit margin is. In the future, your contact lens will scan everything in a store, tell you who's cheating you, tell you who has the best product, what is the profit margin on every single thing that you can scan with your, with your contact lens. And so capitalism becomes perfect. Perfect supply and demand. This means that there are winners and losers. The losers will be middlemen. Because why did Amazon become so big? Why did Airbnb? Why did Uber become so quickly so large? Because they digitized the middlemen. I love the expression of all the people that are sitting there listening. Going, going, what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> so, uh, to, you know, so if you think about insurance, you think about any industry that's got middlemen that's connecting supply and demand, uh, I think he puts it perfectly. If that gets digitized, you're creating infinite scalability. And quite honestly, that's that what drove Amazon, Uber, Airbnb uh, for, for growing so quickly, so fast. I mean, Airbnb has got more hotel rooms than any major hotel chain. How did that happen, right? So we need to think about our industries as, from a health perspective, uh, if we apply the same principles, uh, we have to create data, um, sort of monetize our data and create platforms. Uh, we've got to create connections with, with the care enablement, care delivery um, sort of organization of the world, and really start to move into thinking about preventive, proactive, predictive health, as opposed to just you know, taking care of the six. So how does that happen? Uh, so it turns out I think we can frame health uh, health insurance uh, also as a supply and demand problem. So the supply, you know, as you would imagine, would be doctors, hospitals, uh, you know, people that you would refer to, uh, perhaps digital technologies that might uh, imitate doctors, RoboDoc, whomever, uh, whatever innovation that might happen in the future. All those things are the supply side. The demand side, obviously, it's all of us as consumers. It could be employers. It could be various modalities in which you know, care is delivered. All that could be the demand side. We at them uh, are sitting in the middle of that. And you know, our view is, for us, digitizing health, health care, means digitizing Anthem and digitizing supply and demand. So I'll click through some examples of how that comes to life uh, to, to emphasize kind of what I'm saying here. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a patient at home. So picture this scenario. So if we're providing a, a digitized set of capabilities to doctors that are in the Anthem network, they could do what Postmates, Grubhub, you know, any of the food Uber Eats, food delivery companies are doing for restaurants. So an average restaurant that uh, has 50 or 100 seats, uh, their capacity is limited by the kitchen and the number of seats in that, in that restaurant. You know, what if they created a kitchen and took the recipes and created whatever food uh, was and uh, dishes that were necessary by to serve the population that they wanted to go after? They could simply do that, not by creating more restaurants and more chains, but by creating more kitchens and partnering with companies like Uber Eats and Grubhub and Postmates. Uh, what if there was a company out there, uh, idea for your startup, Mahendra, Docmates, that basically did the same thing for doctors? Uh, so here's an example of what that might look like. So here's patient Sarah. She's sitting at home watching this great movie, Ben-Hur. And in pops the doctor. Says, hey, Sarah, it's Dr. Thomas. Would you like to see me? Obviously, uh, you know, Ben-Hur. She's watched it several times, so why not? So she says, yes. So here's Dr. Thomas. Uh, comes in with a visit. And thank you, you're done. 
back to the movie. So what did that do? So that meant that uh, Dr. Thomas there needed to use a platform like DocMate. We needed a technology that would plug into your television, uh, have a camera there that would you know, facilitate a two-way interaction. All those things, by the way, exist. The, the camera, the USB, and, on, on, and the television, uh, the ability to do telemedicine visits. It just hasn't been configured this way to make this happen just yet. Uh, good news is we're working on things like these with, with major hospitals. And uh, the feedback has been great. Patients love it because instead of getting into their car and getting to the hospitals for routine things, uh, they can just schedule the visit and uh, see Dr. Thomas you know, where, uh, when, when and where it's most convenient to them. And doctors love it because they can manage their workload and rather than having to see as many patients as they can to maximize billing, they can spread the day out and take care of these calls um, per their schedule as opposed to be driven by, by billing requirements. So we feel it's good for the system. It liberates um, you know, the patients and doctors to do care differently and is an example of how we might digitize supply and demand. Uh, here's an example of what's happening in our homes today. So monitoring at home uh, is a very cumbersome process because the infrastructure needed and the technology and the contraptions needed uh, to do simple things like uh, monitoring for sleep apnea is is really hard and very inconvenient. Uh, so most people don't do it, and as a result, uh, they get adverse events and become chronic patients and you know suffer from other health consequences. Good news is, uh, you know, sensors and uh, technologies like sensors are on this exponential curve of maturity, where uh, you know the size is being miniaturized and. Uh, the data that's being gathered from it is getting more and more sophisticated. So we can do things like what this technology is doing. So this person has got nothing on his person, and this dot is showing you um, the movement. He's just walking around in a circle there. And there's a device behind the wall that's uh, essentially sending uh, waves uh, through Wi-Fi waves that basically are bouncing off against him, and, and it's kind of seeing where you know, tracking the movement, so to speak. It says, you know, since we're in a movie theater, I'll say it's probably as close as we'd come to the force, you know, being activated uh, and you know, providing data for us. Uh, but why does that matter? Yeah, because if not, this is the alternative. No one does it. Uh, how is Anthem using it? We are currently facing a silent epidemic affecting 29 million Americans. It is so silent, 80% don't even know they have it. Okay, maybe it's not so silent. In addition to affecting your loved ones, obstructive sleep apnea puts unknown sufferers at increased risk of diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure. Today, Intrusive home sleep testing devices are what we rely on to detect the 23 million undiagnosed Americans with obstructive sleep apnea. What if the diagnostic power of those tubes, wires, and bands existed in simple adhesives? It turns out, it does. At Anthem Innovation, we are fundamentally shifting how we diagnose OSA while driving a 10x reduction in the cost by partnering with leading technologists to bring an innovative experience to sufferers. You have the opportunity to be a part of that fundamental shift. Join us in our quest to transform the, healthcare. The key there was, you know, the, the sensor technology got miniaturized, we're able to send it, we're able to, to monitor uh, very quickly. Uh, the sound of snoring there, hopefully it was not my presentation, it was just truly uh, sleep apnea. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of the two examples, right? So doctor uh, visiting uh, Sarah, uh, using the television, uh, us sending sensors out to patients so we can monitor the bat and, and quickly detect and prevent. Uh, so what is it gonna take to pull all of this off? There was, a, uh, Mahendra and I were just talking and he said, uh, rise together, right? It was great, I think that's some, I'll borrow that with your permission and reuse it. And Rise Together, I think you said, is with uh, your customers, your employees, and your, your shareholders. It's not that different for Anthem. 
you know, we have, we have to serve our members, our patients, and we have to serve them with distinction, and we have to take care of our employees. And of course, if we do those two things together, I think uh, our shareholders will be rewarded. This was a great book by uh, Jeannie Bliss uh, uh, several years ago. It said, I love you more than my dog. It's about the loyalty that customers feel towards brand, where their love of that brand uh, exceeds that of, of a dog, of their pets, which is hard to believe, knowing my pets. Uh, but it's a great book around loyalty and how, how to build it. So going back to the, this notion of how does Anthem get into the space of saying, hey, we'll work with doctors to bring uh, innovative solutions like that to your home. How will we be in the process of or uh, create solutions to fix uh, things like sleep apnea? We need the brand permission to be able to do that. So investing in, in the brand capabilities to be enabling us to be that trusted partner. And what is it going to take? You know, that's where... Uh, uh, Rocky Balboa comes out, I saw a poster of him you know, in the movie theater or somewhere, but he wrote the script for Rocky in uh, the mid-70s, and uh, he shopped it around to, to several people in Hollywood, and the universal answer was, no, we're not going to, you know, this, this movie doesn't make sense, uh, you know, Boxer, you know, it's just, just not stuff that we do. And, he sh and then eventually, um, he was so broke that he had to, to sell his dog, and the two things together and uh, to, to survive, and uh, fortunately he was able to sell a script and someone offered him $300,000 to buy a script. Uh, and he said, okay, I'll sell it to you, but under one condition, that you cast me in this movie. And they said, no, you talk funny, and uh, no, no, you're, you're not the right, right fit for this, for this role, so they didn't cast, they said, no, we're not gonna do it. So he did sell it, you know, it was, was so broke that he actually had to sell his pet to survive, said no to $300,000 in the 70s. Uh, eventually, someone gave him uh, $75,000 and said, okay, we'll cast it in the movie. And of course, uh, you know, Rocky, several, six, seven, eight, and then Creed, it's still a phenomenon 40 years later. Right, so that's the dogged pursuit that it's going to take to succeed and overcome all of the lessons that, that Tony is going to talk about. That's my pet. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're asking uh, data, the amount of data that's thrown off by the sensors. Uh, and so I, what we're looking at is uh, roughly healthcare today, without sensors, uh, healthcare data doubles every 73 days. Uh, with sensors, uh, our forecast is that it's going to double every 24 hours. Yeah, so that, that's just kind of the amount of data we're going to have to deal with. Other questions? All right. Uh, hi, Roger. Uh, great presentation. Thank you so much. So um, I'm assuming everybody else in the industry is also the big five, right? Your, your top four competitors, Humana, Sigma, United, uh, Aetna, are, are also having their digital strategies. Where do you think Anthem differentiates? Uh, you know, every company has a digital strategy. I don't, I don't think there's anything uh, groundbreaking in that, per se. 
I think what's different about Anthem is that uh, this isn't a technology strategy. This is really Anthem's business strategy. Uh, and I don't think our co competition is, is looking at it that way. They think of it as an adjunct thing that replaces uh, the existing legacy technologies of today. Uh, we don't think of it that way at all. We think our future is that Anthem becomes an AI company. And, and that, I think, is fundamentally different. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you.